If you're ready to experience more peace and joy in your life, if you want to feel more comfortable in your own skin, and if you're ready to discover and expand on your energetic gifts and personal power, you're in the right place. So here's your host, Kelly Sparta. Welcome back to Spirit Guides. I am your host, Kelly Sparta. A transformational shaman, spiritual coach, spiritual business coach, and I'm here as always on Mondays with my friend and coach in my company, Joshua Radawan, and he is an amazing spiritual practitioner. He, he does really great work. You guys, we haven't talked about this, but Josh is actually working with people in the paranormal community to keep them safe. And so if you're out there listening and you're in the paranormal community, you really need to talk to Josh because he is doing that work and he is doing great work in that community. So, but today we're going to be talking about past lives. Was I Cleopatra in a past life or just really good at applying eyeliner? And I have to tell you, I love these titles. I love the fun and I love that Josh writes them. (laughs) I'm really looking forward to this this one in particular because I've had some pretty interesting past life experiences in this life. Really tapping back into the Akashic. It took me like three months one time, you know, like I was, you know, trying to get into the Akashic and they're like, no, no, no. And when I wasn't expecting it, the doors just <laughs> opened wide and I was not prepared for everything they show me. I mean, they say that you can, they'll only give you what you can handle. And it's true. I mean, like I'm still here. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the experience I had after that, I, I, mean, I remember it like it was yesterday, you know, like they showed me, you know, I was really struggling with some of the fear in part of my, in my, you know, journey here through the, the healing process. And they showed me my deaths, none of the stuff that I, you know, was asking to see, but they showed me what I needed to see. But I, I remember I had, I had a sleep mask on cause I do my best visualization in there and I tore it off and I was like, Nope, <laughs> I just like, I threw the mask and I was like, absolutely not. But it took me a couple of months after that to really understand what they were trying to, you know, re- relay to me at that time. So what's your, what's your experience been with like past lives, past life regression or any, any of that? Oh my God. So many things. <laughs> so my, my favorite story is actually, I walked into this party. Now, it was, you know, a bunch of pagan folks. So, you know, it was understood in the room that people had this sort of belief structure somewhat. But I walked into this party of people I, you know, the vast majority of whom I had never met before. And this very large, rotund, flamingly gay man turns around and goes, Oh my God, how you i have not seen you since the crimean war and i'm like oh my god yes <laughs> in that moment i remembered us being brothers in arms in the crimean war and all of the things that we had done together it was a me i was like yes how are you we were instant friends it was hysterical oh, so awesome. <clears throat> you know <laughs> this is this is what happens in these communities right <laughs> like you would think that quietly to yourself <laughs> In in sort of mundane world, in Muggle Land, but but in in these worlds, people go yes, land past life. Have you been right? And so there was that 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 was the fastest, funniest one. But um, <clears throat> and you guys, if you hear me hanging, that's because I've been sick for the last couple of weeks. I'm just just getting better. The other one that really was significant in my life is that I was handed the book, The Red Goddess. And and when I say handed it, I mean that like multiple people in a week, who, multiple unrelated people in a week told me I had to get this book. And this was before it came out on paperback. So getting the book meant paying 85 pounds to the publisher to get the hardback copy. And which I, w- I was so... I was excited and to find that my book number was 669. <laughs> I was like, I just missed 666, but you know, 669 is good too. <laughs> so, but the, uh, <clears throat> the book itself, if you haven't read it and if you, so let me say this, if you're going to read this book, if you want to pick this book up, 
this is this is an esoteric book. It is you, you really kind of have to have some background in mythology and the whole Golden Dawn and Aleister Crowley and all of that in order for you to really fully get what's going on in the book. If you want something that gives the impression of the book and that gives you the, sort of the, the things about it, then Sarah Beek, S-E-R-A Beek, B-E-A-K, wrote uh, Red Hot and Holy, Red Hot and Holy. And that book is, is a good approximation of what's going on in the Red Goddess book. And for those of you who know these things and are aware of them, I will warn you that I spent the entire bo book going, oh my God, this man is amazing. He's, he's, he's so good. And the other half of the book going, stupid fucking man, he didn't get the point at all, right? <laughs> because, uh, you know, he just doesn't, he, he, patriarchy is heavy in this man's eyes, right? And so I, I, I spent, <laughs> I spent half the book in, in adoration and in very big frustration and upset. So just be aware. And so the, 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 the upshot of it is that it talks about the practice that the Golden Dawn was doing of bringing back the goddess into the world. And they were working on this in the, you know, 20s to 40s, right? And the thing that was showing up for me at this time <clears throat> is that I had been a priestess back in Mesopotamian, Sumerian, way back, way back. You? Time frame. Me. Yeah. I had been a priestess in <laughs> a past life, right? That's what we're talking about past lives. You, you asked me to tell a past life story. <laughs> I know. I went shocker, right? Yeah. So I'd been a high priestess in the, te in, in the temple of the goddess. <laughs> And, you know, we would, we use tantric techniques and healing techniques and, and you, we were sacred prostitutes for men returning from war. And, you know, we would get them right in their heads and get them over the trauma of war before we would send them home to their wives and whatever. And so it was, uh, I had very clear memories of this, right? And so as I'm reading this book, all of these memories are coming flooding back to me. And <clears throat> at this time in my life, for about 18 months, somewhere around there, 12, 18 months, I was meeting people who were all in that temple with me. And I was just like, bang, 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 bang. And, and some of these people came into my life for this, this period of time, and then I've never heard from them again. Okay. So this is, this, this happens. Right. And so, you know, there's, there's all these people are surrounding me who have been priestesses or eunuchs in this temple. And I'm, I'm drawn with, there's three other women who I was really, we were drawn together to do a massive ritual that was to bring back the goddess and well, to bring forth. So here's the thing. People, people think, oh, patriarchy bad. Bring the goddess back. Go into matriarchy. No, no, no. Any single thing is out of balance if it's by itself. You need to have balance. And so what we did was we worked on bringing into form the divine union temple. Okay. <clears throat> on the astral. All right. And we, we did this ritual. And we, here's the weird thing is that it was all women. We tried everything we could to get four men to balance this group. And no one would say yes. Not a single man would say yes to this. Did and so it ended eunuchs? up being the four. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fair question. But one of the women in the group, one of the women in the group had been a eunuch at the temple. So that's why I mentioned that. Um, but the, you know, so we, we didn't have any men involved, but it wasn't for lack of trying. And the, <clears throat> and I don't know, maybe that was appropriate because the, the culture in which we were operating was in, in the masculine. And so that provided the masculine energy, right? And so, but whatever we did, we set up an altar on the table for the U.S. And my mother had died very recently at that time. And so I, I did not open the flag because we didn't have a funeral. She didn't want that whole shebang. She, she was like, eh, no, no, no. And so I had kept the flag. I asked for the flag because she had been a, a veteran. 
and I opened the box from the Veterans Administration with the American flag in it to serve as the altar cloth for this because I wanted it connected into the, the government, right? <clears throat> I wanted it connected into the country. And so we used the, the flag as the altar cloth for the U.S., and then we built an altar on top of that for balanced masculine feminine energy. And then underneath the table, to acknowledge the, the First Nations, we did a second altar to honor the First Nations and to pull the energy of the balance that they hold within their nation of masculine and feminine, because that's, that's at the root of the land in the U S right. Is the first nations energy. And so we're like, well, let's, let's use that sympathetic energy. Yeah. <laughs> and pull that up and <clears throat> the, and, and built that altar as well. And then we did a ritual. Now I had a piece of my mother's ashes. I had a bit of my mother's ashes that I put as a, as a sacrifice on the table as a, saying, you know, this is a big working, it requires a sacrifice. Here it is. <clears throat> I was the only person who offered a sacrifice on the table. <clears throat> this becomes relevant later because we knew that the working wasn't done when we finished the ritual. We could feel that it was not done coalescing. And so we took all of the elements of both altars and put them into a single box and we took turns over the course of the next 18 months taking care of the box. We each, you know, we rotated the box between different people. And in eight, and 18 months later, we finally felt like the working was complete and we closed the ritual. And in that 18 months, I was the only person who did not get deathly ill. The other three ended up in the hospital oh, wow. <clears throat> with random things that nobody could identify exactly what they were. That's, so that was very interesting. And then when we moved to Richmond, I still had the flag. The flag had still been in my possession because when we closed the ritual, everybody took back whatever their pieces were from the box and, and, you know, we closed that, but the, the flag still felt like it had stuff in it. And so I kept it in a plastic bag separate from everything else in my altar section. And, um, <clears throat> and I just didn't do anything with it. And then, when we hit Richmond, which was <clears throat> eight years later, which eight is the number of completion, right? So eight years later, I, I had the, the flag and we burned the flag to release the energy just before <clears throat> COVID hit and Black Lives Matter exploded and all of the angst and upset started to overflow. And it's like, Oh, okay. So this is finally working now, right? <clears throat> Not that I intended for there to be all of this angst and upset, but anytime you're bringing something big into the world, you know, big things happen as a result. And so we, we burn the flag at that point to release that energy because it needed to not be stuck there anymore. Right. It was, it was done incubating and now needed to be released. And so, um, but you know, these are all, past life things, right? I mean, it's, it's this life, but it's past life because all of these people came together and, and my awareness of the need to do this came through all of these people from my past life showing up and, and bringing to, bringing to the surface, my memories of this particular life and how it worked and what it was about and, and why it was important and all those things. So, so I got a, I got a fun story too. And I've, I've been waiting to hear your take on it for a while. So, uh, okay. it was a, it was a, a rock. Yeah. You love these stories. So I do. it was, it was a couple of years ago, you know, um, the ascended master Merlin kept coming to me and, you know, like I've always, always been really connected with the wizard type, you know, like I, you know, like I was 14 when I started reading the sort of truth series, you know, knocking out a thousand page novel after a thousand page novel. Cause I just, there was something about that for me. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, and I have to say, before I really stepped into the magical portion of the, the journey, Morgana kept coming up. And I, when I felt like I was under attack, I felt the Morrigan, right? And that Morrigan being connected to, you know, Arthurian times. And I didn't really put it together until last year. And this, this is where it gets fun. So I started connecting with Merlin. And 
you know, reading about him and reading about reading the poetry that was, you know, it was all really based on poetry, you know. So f from there, I meet Cassie and her daughter's name is Avalon. Right. And of course, uh, it, is. <laughs> and of course it is. Right. Because this magical world. And, and I have to say, you know, like, you know, in, in, in that in that context, you know, Merlin and Morgana kind of go at it, you know, off and on throughout the throughout the process. And that's been oh yeah what's going on with me and Avalon at times. Like I, it, it's it's so funny, you know. Like I, I've learned so much by, because it feels to me like I'm trying to heal past life stuff. If that makes sense, like I'm trying to take a different route than what was before, and to, I you know I I don't know exactly what I'm doing at this force in the journey, but because of my work that I've been doing in the programs, I see this all in a different light. But I mean, like once it's like you said, all of these characters come out at the the same time. I met a gentleman whose last name is Lancelot. I mean, like, what are the odds of that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, almost and he, zero, yeah. Almost zero, right? <clears throat> like, it's it's crazy. But you know, what's your what's your take on that? Because I've always wondered, you know, like, you know, what is that? Well, so. So you're not saying you're so you're bringing this up on a past life episode, but you're not saying I have a memory of being in, being so and so in a past life. So, you know, do you have a memory? You know, when it comes to past life stuff, you know, everybody talks about being kings and queens. And I, I have to say that I don't. I haven't really seen much past. Yeah. Okay. You know, like this instance and my <laughs> deaths in multiple lives. There were definitely some deaths from older times. You know, like I, I've seen them from the 1800s, 1700s, you know, witch trials. That was what it felt like, you know, and, and you know, but uh, when I, when I sit, if, well, I did do one past life regression once with a hypnotist. And during that time, I felt being in a castle. You know, there was a castle, but I, I, once again, I felt like I was being tortured because that's all the cool stuff that spirit throws me when it comes to past life stuff. It's just the, uh, <laughs> I, 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 the, I have not unlocked the other parts yet, or I have not been shown the other parts yet. But I, when I, I, I do remember being in a castle at one point. So that is, that is the okay. extent of that. Well, and they, they do say that the Arthurian legends are part history part tr truth so you know part history part mythos right is what i meant to say and so yeah so it feels to me like what you've done is you've tapped heavily into the archetype of the arthurian legends and being that you have identified with those with that archetype you're pulling the archetypal interactions into your experience and that's what happens right as we we tap in and we identify with something. When you when you identify with something, you will create the reality around it. That's just how that is. Is that one of the and dangers so of show past life together. regressions then? You know, like if you over identify with what you go back and see, can you relive some of that past? You can, if it's unhealed trauma. Yeah, you can pull that forward. You know, I, I love the, the song Galileo from the, the uh, Indigo Girls talking about, you know, all the past lives and, and what they're bringing forward. And the, but the, so here's the thing, right? Past lives often can in, can influence our current existence. Right. And so I really, <clears throat> the thing about past lives is that people get very curious about them and they treat it like a game. It's like, Ooh, who was I in a past life? Ooh, this'll be fun. And you know, that's a whole lot of, you know, just doing things for entertainment. It's not actually going to help your journey. However, there are times when past lives come into play. I was doing a piece of business coaching for a client and his past life experience of having been a merchant that was doing fairly well and then being recognized by the king and pulled up into fame and fortune and he did amazing and then due to no fault of his own the king he fell from favor with the king and he became destitute and not even able to make a living and died poor and and impoverished and and so he had this resistance in his business 
to growing past a certain stage because he didn't want to relive that past life. And he wasn't even aware that he had that. But when we started digging into it, that past life is what showed up for me when I was when I was talking to him. And I was like, oh, this is what's going on. He was like, oh, my God, yes, that feels so true to me. And I'm like, yeah, OK, so let's work through the past life issue because it's not a current life issue that's causing this. Right. So sometimes the past life stuff is what's what's limiting for a lot of people on a spiritual path who are trying to share their spiritual gifts. Having been killed in a past life for your gifts is a big deal. Right. And. You know, it could be you were killed for your gifts. It could be you were cursed for your gifts. We don't know. But, you know, if if something bad happened to you as a result of your gifts, you may not let yourself step into your gifts, right? I count Until four, you resolve four the of those deaths. Trauma. I count four of those yeah. deaths they showed me, which were extremely brutal. And, uh, you know, I yes. don't know if you've ever watched that horror movie VHS where it's all like cutaways. You know, it's like little short films about these terrible that's what it showed up like and after that i actually looked up you know i was like watching the vhs movies i was like this was on there there's no way that is what happened to me <laughs> and, you know is but but it was about the fear and you know it was it also for me showed why the phoenix was so symbolic in my life um it, it, it you know like i did not you know like that phoenix has all been around since the onset of my journey and i saw why that was on a much deeper level than just the you know the idea of the phoenix i i saw it as the reincarnation over and over again you know and yeah i i might well, have been a little and, too brash in my past lives <laughs> past lives also, also a warrior yeah also a warrior past lives past lives <laughs> what Mm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I speaking of Phoenix, I had a conversation with someone whose name was Phoenix recently, and I'm going to tell you the same thing I told her, which is that Phoenix is also an archetype energy. And the archetype energy is arising from the ashes. But before you can arise from the ashes, you have to become ashes. And so be careful about identifying with the energy of the Phoenix. It's the same energy as survivor right? It's like, you don't want to stay in survivor after you've survived something, because when you identify as survivor, you will draw to you more things to survive to maintain your identity. Yeah. And, and the same sense. thing happens with the Phoenix. I, I, I've really right? dropped that archetype. You know, it came in the very beginning yeah. because I was Good. burning from the ashes yeah. of my former self. But I will tell you, you know, it came up during different parts of you know, shamanic death or identity shift too. You know, not not as often in the last three years. Um, not as often in the last three years. And there's probably a reason I can't, I haven't been able to really get into my next book yet because I wanted to call it Phoenix Awakening because the first one was Phoenix Crashing. <laughs> and I've, I've got I've got this amazing start to it, but I'm like, there's something about, you know, now that I'm, I'm talking with you and talking it out, there's something about that that I don't identify with. And now I'm, it's funny because I remember being at an author reading and, and, you know, someone asked me like, well, well, why is the Phoenix so important to you? And I had to stop because <laughs> I was like, that's a pretty good question. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I, I, it's, it's funny. That's awesome. Thank you for, thank you for sharing yeah. that. <laughs> well, happy to help with the book. So <laughs> how do people get your book, by the way? We're, we're uh, going to put that in the show notes, right? They messaged me directly. You know, I, I was, I, I just started re remarketing it myself. You know, like I took a year mm -hmm. off from marketing it because, you know, I was going through a deep process, you know, in the work with you. And I was really like, what is the message of this book? You know, what is, what is, cause I, I wrote it while I was still half in addiction, you know, and then I wrote the mm -hmm. second half of it while I was going through, you know, the welcome to the woo program. So like there is, you know, mm -hmm. like very much a dualistic approach. And I was very heavy into Charles Bukowski at the time and in love with the gutter drunk lifestyle. So, you know, it's, I, I, I had to really sit with what is the message of this? And the truth is, is it was absolutely my internal dialogue at the time which is extremely valid to those going through a similar situation it just took me a year to get there yeah. with it to to put it back out there all right well we we will put it on the spirit guide school site as well so we'll get awesome. that up there for people so that they can find it there and um <clears throat> the 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 thing about past lives so coming back to the question of past life what was it you were saying just before we got off on the phoenix thing help me 
the past life deaths. There were. So what were you saying before? Oh, past life death. Thank you. Yes. So the thing about past lives <clears throat> is that they can stop you from doing this, stop you from doing things. And so, you know, with the, I was killed for my gifts in a past life. It's a very simple solution to that. All you have to do is say, you got to die somehow, right? Nobody gets out of this life alive. Got to die somehow. So if you just like, yeah, okay, if, if I got to die somehow, might as well die for a purpose, right? So that'll get you past that one. However, I had a friend who was trying to launch her website and could not for the life of her. I mean, she was working on it and working on it. She had it up. It was really good, but she just couldn't hit launch. She couldn't publish it. Right. And, you know, I, I looked at her. I was like, yeah, because you got hung really badly in your last life for your gifts. And she's like, yeah, I'm like, it was bad. She's like, yeah, I still have neck problems today from that. And I'm like, Yeah. And so, you know, I, I looked at her, I, I went into the ethers and I looked at the probability lines and I said, look, I cannot guarantee that you will not be killed for your gifts in this life, but I can guarantee that if it happens, it will be with a gun, not a hanging. She said, oh, I can do that. And she hit publish. <laughs> I was like, that was it. It was just, she just needed to know she was not getting hung again. That was all she needed to know. And, you know, there was one probability line in which that might have happened, but I needed to, to say it. Right. And so, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, being able to know that it's not going to happen in the same way. Right. <clears throat> so I hope our healers are out there are taking notes, you know, our, our practitioners, you know, like, you know, like everything you've talked about really shows how we can use you know, to past lives to heal what's going on in the present life, you know, in, in ourselves and, you know, uh, in our clients, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that, you know, the, the, the regular world doesn't maybe see the muggle world as you called it earlier, you know, there's a, a lot going on behind the scenes, um, you know, and, and yeah. being able to utilize well, all those skills. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's even somebody else's past life that is impacting you. Right. So, you know, I'm sure we'll do some stuff with ancestral work later down the road, but you know, I've seen people have curses on their family lines that have to be addressed, you know? So, you know, we can talk about that sort of thing in a, in a future episode about ancestral line issues, because those are, are relevant as well. Right. Epigenetics and ancestral line work is huge. Right. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, we will definitely do a, an episode on that uh, so that you guys get, get the whole shebang on that. But, you know, let's just, for the, for the last little minute here, let's think about if you want to identify how a past life might be impacting you, okay? The very first thing that you want to look at is, is, is there any real life scenario stuff that is impacting you because people try to blame past lives for things so often that are not past life. Okay. So the last place you should look is past life and ancestral stuff. I mean, that's just the last thing you should be looking for is that because <clears throat> more often than not, it is something in your life today that is the issue, your belief structures, your history, your experiences, your fears, whatever, right? If you have exhausted every possible option for that and you see absolutely no reason why this would be the case, then it's time to take a look in past lives and epigenetics and, you know, ancestral line and stuff. <clears throat> because the, the, it is very rare for that to be the case. Okay. But when it is, it's big, right? <laughs> it's big. And so that would be the time that I would go and see a past life a regressionist or a psychic who can help you figure out what your past life was now, or maybe, you can, or maybe a shaman. Yes. <laughs> um, the, you know, you, can you do this work yourself? Yes, you can. You can sit down with spirit and have that conversation with them. But it, it you know, as you pointed out, Josh, sometimes they are forthcoming and sometimes they aren't. So, and you know, if you're up in your head and you have a hard time believing what you're getting, which is what happens in the beginning is that when you don't have a lot of experience with this, when you don't, when you haven't built your psychic muscles yet, when you haven't built your trust in your own ability to see, then past life regression stuff can be kind of hard to get on your own. 
when you're further along in the journey, it's really not that difficult. But in the beginning, it can be tough to either get what you need or believe that you got what you needed, right? <clears throat> Both of which are equally relevant. So I would say, you know, get some outside help with that if you're in the beginning of your journey. And so a past life regressionist or a shaman or a psychic or, you know, somebody who can help you with something like that. And, you know, then take what you get and work with it as though it is present life. That's the key. Okay. Because you can't fix what's already happened. You can only address what's present in your soul in this moment. So you can't be like, oh, well, he shouldn't have felt that way because that happened or, you know, whatever. And it, no, 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 you can't do it that way. You have to do it as though you're processing in the current moment the experience that that person had when you were in their life experience. That's the only way you're going to process through it. Okay. All right. So hopefully that helps. Make sure to like, rate, and subscribe. We, we are, uh, we're doing great on the ratings and we would love to continue to do that. We really appreciate you. If you appreciate us, please let us know. And if you have ideas for episodes, by all means, let us know that too. And don't forget what you focus on expands. What you intend is what you create. So choose wisely. So that's it for today's episode of Spirit Guides Podcast. Head on over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen and subscribe to the show. Every week, one lucky listener who subscribes and posts a review on iTunes will be entered into a drawing for a $10,000 value grand prize and a private reading with Kelly Sparta herself. Be sure to head on over to spiritguidespodcast.com and pick up a free copy of Kelly's gift and join us on the next episode. Show